Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new webinar uh, from the International Energy Agency. Uh, we are very happy to, to be with you today again to continue our journey on energy data and energy modeling. So uh, today uh, we are very, very pleased and lucky to have colleagues from uh, Imperial College and other uh, universities, part of, uh, of the net, of same network and part of the Climate Compatible Growth uh, Initiative, who will share with you their perspective on energy modeling and and who will present to you a series of very interesting, very accessible and useful tools, uh, which are all um, or mostly um, open line. So um, that too, they will present to you some um, some very um, useful approaches and practical uh, models and tools that we will be able to work on uh, again later on in this uh, capacity reinforcement program. And they will also uh, share some analysis and work uh, they've, been working, uh, they've been working on. So just reminding you where we are. Um, yesterday, you heard from the colleagues from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, and today, so it's uh, another uh, academic partner. Um, I, I think as uh, you, you hear from energy modeling experts from the IEA and also from uh, other academic partners. Uh, you, you will hear, uh, I think, the same messages, but put in, in different ways uh, as we, we share the same approach for, um, for energy modeling. But we really wanted to give you a complementary perspective from, uh, from academic uh, institutions. Tomorrow, we will have one session on um, SDG 7.1, which is access to clean cooking and to electricity. Uh, and uh, Friday will be our last uh, session with um, an interactive uh, quiz. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll close this uh, first phase of our um, capacity reinforcement program for Nigeria. So without further notice, I'd like to um, leave you in the very expert uh, and knowledgeable hands of uh, Carla and Lucy. Uh, who will introduce themselves in, in a second. They will be joined a bit um, later in the, in the session by Mark Owells, who has also been developing many initiatives related to capacity reinforcement in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and in other uh, parts of the world on energy modeling. So they will be able to, to share with you uh, their, um, their work and their perspective. Carla, Lucy, thank you very, very much for being here. And uh, I wish you a very good session with our group of Nigerian who uh, so far has been very dynamic, very interested, uh, asking many questions. So to all of you, continue as you already do, raising your hand whenever you need or using the Q&A functionality for, uh, for any question. Wish you a good session to all and uh, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, great to talk to you all. Um, so my name's Lucy. I've been working for the Climate Compatible Growth Programme for about six or seven months now. And before that, uh, I completed a master's at Imperial, focusing on, on energy systems and energy policy. And my thesis was actually a modelling study on Nigeria. So I'm particularly happy to talk to you all today and chat to you afterwards. So for the start of the session, I'll just give a bit of an intro to what we do, uh, to some of the key tools we've been using and um, some of the things that we've developed in the past, the past few months. So let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. Carla, are you able to, to see my slides? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Okay, so the Climate Compatible Growth Programme is uh, basically a large research programme funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And its aim is to kind of support sustainable economic growth in the global south with a focus on energy systems and transport systems and looking at the synergies between development and climate change mitigation and adaptation. So its main function is to provide research and global public goods. So we have a large focus on open, free and accessible tools and data. And we'll talk about that a little more in a lot more detail in the session. 
And the programme is made up of primarily a range of universities, mostly in the UK, but also some international universities and a range of international partners and multinational development banks uh, with partners, including the IEA. We're grateful to join you on the session today. OK, so I wanted to introduce two of our main outputs from the first kind of six months of the CCG programme. And I'll go into a bit of detail on these before handing over to Carla. So the first thing we've been working on are these uh, starter data kits. So basically, um, we found that when a lot of people go to start an energy modelling study, the biggest barrier is often data availability. And often it can take a month or more to just kind of find the very basic data needed to start off your energy systems model. And that can often put a lot of people off using some energy modeling tools. So the idea here is that we developed free data sets for nearly 80 countries across Africa, developing Asia and South America. And they contain all of the kind of core data for an energy systems model, all sourced from open public data sources. And the idea isn't that this is the most accurate data that you could possibly find, but that it should be a nice starting point that in-country analysts and experts like yourselves can take on and improve using your own knowledge and experience. Basically trying to make things quicker, more, more accessible and easier. So these are hosted on a, a data website called Zenodo. And then we have some articles that kind of explain our approach and our assumptions. And I'll go into some more detail on that next. And then the second output I wanted to, to discuss was our online courses and summer school. So we've developed so far five uh, free online courses, each focusing on a different aspect of energy modeling, ranging from kind of capacity expansion to geospatial modeling and financial planning of energy infrastructure. And these have been developed uh, by the CCG program, but with a lot of collaboration from international partners listed on the slide and a range of universities. And these are again, completely free and accessible and hopefully will act as kind of pre-training before the capacity building program such as this by the IEA. And then our other outputs mainly so far have been research papers, um, preprints and new open and accessible software. And the program is will be around for at least the next five years. So we hope to, to develop much more in this next phase. So a little detail on these starter data kits. So as I said, we kind of hope that these will be a nice zero order starting point for in-country analysts like yourselves to build on and make better. So they contain the data that you need to make a very simple zero order energy systems model, including not just the power sector, but also other non-power demands. We've collected all of the data from international public data sources. So we use quite a lot of IEA data, data from IRENA and, and previous energy modeling studies. And all of this data is referenced and cited so you can see where all of the data is from. And we've created these models for nearly 80 countries, all with the same shared basic countries, basic structure, sorry. And we've adapted that structure to suit the country. So turning technologies on or off and changing demands and costs. And the idea is that, that an in-country analyst could take this model and make it better and develop their own scenarios depending on the aim of their study. And the models are kind of uh, fairly comprehensive. So they go from uh, primary fuel production all the way to consumption with heating systems, vehicles and use technologies considered and a range of power plant technologies. And we split demands by sector so we focused on industrial, commercial, residential and transport sectors. And as I said, it's not just power demand. We also consider heating, transport and cooking demands. And they were all made using this very simple Excel based sand interface that works for osmosis. So we've kind of collected all of the data and all of this data could be used in any, any energy modeling tool. It doesn't have to be osmosis. But then we went ahead and developed an example model using osmosis and this kind of Excel interface that Carla will, will share some more details on later in this session. 
And then in case uh, anybody wants to use these starter kits, um, I'll explain a little bit about how they're published. So we have a preprint paper that contains an explanation of everything we did. And then the appendix contains this example, osmosis energy systems model. And we model two or three stylized scenarios, depending on the country. And again, this isn't supposed to be a highly accurate energy modeling study. It's supposed to be an example of what you can do with this data and what you could replicate and, and improve on with your own knowledge. So for Nigeria, we modeled two stylized scenarios that you can see the results of. And then we have a kind of more extensive data set hosted on a website called Zenodo. So we have a repository for each country that contains all of the data in CSV files. And then we also have a base interface uh, for osmosis. So you could download this Excel interface and in a couple of hours, you could have a model running for Nigeria that you could then improve using your own data and your own knowledge to refine scenarios. And all of this can be found on the CCG website, which um, I'll show later. I'll reshare my screen and show, show you this. OK, so that's all on the starter kits. And then the other output that we thought might be useful uh, for you is our online courses. So these are hosted uh, by the Open University on their OpenLearn website. And we created five completely free courses working with a wide range of universities and international partners. And each of the courses focuses on a different aspect of energy systems modeling. So we wanted to kind of be as comprehensive as possible. So the first track focuses on uh, capacity expansion planning and flexibility. So that uses osmosis and the IRENA tool flex tool. And then we kind of go back to the beginning and look at energy balances and projections using two tools from the IAEA. And then there's a course on the more financial aspects of energy infrastructure, again, using an IAEA tool called FinPlan. And then we move to a slightly different aspect. So there's geospatial electrification modeling using a tool called Onset, which is the foundation for the global electrification platform. And then finally, looking beyond just energy, we look at integrated climate, land, energy and water systems modelling uh, clues. And this course was developed uh, by KTH with the World Bank. These are the five we have so far, but I think there are, are more coming in the future. And how to use the courses in case you want to use them. So they're designed to be kind of uh, pre-training before a capacity reinforcement program such as this one by the IEA. So the idea is that by doing this course, you'll get an understanding of the basic concepts of each tool and be able to run your own model uh, using the tool by the end of the course. So the way they're structured is there's a set of theoretical lectures on the theoretical background to the tool. And then we have a large range of practical hands-on exercises that guide you through to developing your own model in each of the tools. And if you complete the course, you'll receive a certificate um, which you can share and they're all accessible on the OpenLearn Create website. And then just another note, um, we, have a, uh, we have already hosted one capacity building event using these online courses. And this was the, the Joint Summer School on Modeling Tools for Sustainable Development. We hosted that um, this month and the month before a three week event. And in the future, we have an upcoming energy modeling platform for Africa event that will be hosted towards the end of this year. And if any of you might be interested in that, we could share details um, of that too. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop sharing and just show you a few of the outputs as they are online. So this is uh, the CCG website. This is where we find the starter data kits that I discussed. So we've created a kit uh, for Nigeria that you can find here. And then the first link takes you to the Zenodo upload for Nigeria. It's basically a set of CSV files containing all of the data. So for example, we have estimated install capacity by technology type. We have the costs and uh, performance parameters for different technologies emissions factors and, and the other data you need to make an energy systems model. And then we have this Excel interface for osmosis, 
that you could download and use to run an osmosis model uh, very quickly and very easily without having to kind of touch the command line or do anything too technical. But Carla will go into some more detail on that later. And then the second link takes you to the preprint for Nigeria. And this is kind of um, an academic article that kind of guides you through what we did to create the starter kit. So there's a data description that basically overviews all of the data again and discusses the sources and any assumptions that we made. So we have techno-economic parameters for all of your power plants, uh, capital cost projections for renewables, refinery data, transmission and distribution data, and then estimated fuel prices, emissions factors, domestic reserves and demand projections. And we cite all of the sources that we used and, and hope that this might be useful as a starting point, again, for in-country experts like yourselves to build on and adapt. And then if you go to the supplementary files in the appendix, uh, which I have open here, we developed an example energy systems model using osmosis, which is again, a free and accessible capacity expansion model. And we detail the model that we made. So this is the reference energy system. And yeah, then we cannot see the ah, okay, sorry. Okay, so in, in the appendix we kind of detail the energy systems model that we created and we show some example results for two scenarios. There's a fossil future scenario and a lease cost scenario. Just examples of what you could do with that kind of data. And then finally, to quickly show you our online courses. So on the Open Learn Create website, there's a, a CCG collection. And you can see here the five courses that we've developed so far. And you're welcome to go and create these courses, um, complete these courses at no cost as a kind of a good pre-training before completing your own modeling study or, or another capacity building event. Okay, so I think that's all for me. I'll hand over to Carla, who will go into some more detail on the energy and flexibility modeling track. And then later in the session, Mark Howells will go over the other four, four areas of energy system modeling that we cover here. Okay, so over to you, Carla. Okay, thanks so much, Lucy, for the, the introduction and thanks a lot for, um, for your kind words at the, at the beginning. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm Carla Cannone, PhD student in Geography and Environment at Loughborough University, uh, working on energy modeling and capacity building uh, in, within Climate Compatible Grow Program, uh, CCG. Uh, so uh, today is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce you to uh, two of the tools that uh, are available, so Osmosis and Flex tool and their application. So I'll quickly share my screen. Lucy, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Can you see the, the entire presentation or just the... Uh, I can see your PowerPoint window. Okay, so... You still see the little slide on the side? Not yeah, the it's not the presentation. Mm. Let's see. One second. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Apologies. Okay, uh, so let's start this. Uh, this is actually one, uh, a, a little, some bit and pieces of one of the lectures that you will find if you decide to enroll in the uh, online course at the Open University. So um, let's start uh, this, uh, this journey of about 30 minutes. So what we will cover is uh, understanding what an energy, energy system modeling is and why it is so important nowadays. Then recall the different types of energy modeling tools available and dive into osmosis flex tool and their uh, application but before um, understanding what energy modeling is energy system modeling is i wanted to recall what an energy system is so an energy system includes everything that goes from fuel production uh, to final energy consumption as we can see in these four uh, circles we go we have energy resources then energy conversion 
energy transportation and final energy demands. So in the energy resources, we can find them both the uh, fossil fuels such as oil, coal, gas, uh, but also the renewable resources uh, such as hydro, uh, geothermal, solar, and, uh, and wind and others. Then these primary resources are converted using different technologies that have different input fuel, as you might know. So we have uh, coal power plants, wind power plants, and uh, PV, and, uh, and so on. All of these produce electricity that then needs to be uh, uh, transported uh, using um, transmission and distribution uh, technologies to the final place where it, 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 it has to be used because the electricity is not consumed where it is uh, produced most of, the, of most of the time. So we need to reach the people. In fact, uh, what drives the entire energy system is the final demands. So us as a society uh, increase the demand for lightning, uh, for uh, cooking, so for different energy services. Uh, so, um, and um, as we can see now in this uh, next, uh, in the second slide, uh, this is a more detailed representation but still a simplified representation of a reference energy system. And this is an example of an energy system, an electricity energy system. So as you can see on the right side, on the demand side, we have only demands for, uh, for electricity. So this doesn't mean that the, uh, this is representative of the reality as uh, the picture shown here is just part of a wider energy system that includes also demands from other sectors such as uh, industry, transport, agriculture, and uh, so on. But it can also get wider and include other systems such as the water system, the land system, and climate. Uh, but we'll come back to this clues model uh, in a couple of minutes. So um, now, just to uh, understand how this is structured. So on the right side, as I told you, there are the, um, uh, the electricity demand. So the final demand that provide the uh, energy services to uh, society. Um, and then on the left side, we see the primary energy resources. Now in this graph, we can see that there we, we can include different options. Uh, so we can have domestic production or input, import of uh, natural resources. All of these are the input for the, um, the technology. So the power plants that we see in the middle that produce electricity that is transmitted, distributed uh, to reach then the final appliances. So here there are two main revolutions happening. So first of all, on the supply side, we know that the uh, cost of solar technologies are becoming extremely cheap, making uh, any investment in uh, renewable in particular, and uh, in particular in solar, uh, much more uh, feasible and uh, from an economic uh, point of view. Um, then on the uh, demand side, instead, we can see a revolution because uh, appliances, so this that we can see here as residential, commercial and industrial, uh, are uh, becoming to beca uh, are uh, becoming much more efficient than uh, than before. So uh, the way forward is increasing the um, the efficiency of uh, these uh, appliances, but. What does it mean uh, to be more efficient? So just to give you an example, recently I uh, changed my fridge and because he had to provide the same service, is now providing the same service as the uh, my old fridge, so to cool down my uh, my food. <clears throat> Sorry. But what happens is now that with the, this uh, double efficiency, I need half of the electricity that I was um, that my fridge was requiring before. So I can have a, a reduction of the, my bills, so I can pay less, but also contribute less to the electricity demand um, in my country or in my city and so on. So imagine that all the fridges in the world and then all the appliances in the world gets get more efficient, then there will be a decrease of the electricity uh, demand. But that we can we can expand the same concept, not only to uh, electricity, uh, electric appliances, but also, for example, to cars that become more efficient and consume less uh, gasoline or less electricity if then we want to move to electric cars. OK, so that said, now we can uh, jump into the modeling itself. So. Uh, 
what is energy system modeling and in particular what is energy system modeling for policy making so is the process of mathematically analyze an energy system using a computer program uh, so therefore a software uh, in order to influence energy policy development so from the results uh, they can be the ground base for uh, discussion to influence uh, energy policy um, decisions uh, so what you can do uh, with an energy model you can simulate a uh, different configuration so under different scenarios so under different constraints and you can assess the cost the environmental impact and the uh, flexibility uh, it's important to so for example if you want to uh, model a, a scenario when to where you add a target on renewables or uh, a, a cap on emission of your country so you want to meet a global uh, climate target you can do so and then compare different pathways to go uh, forward for your uh, for your country and see what is the uh, the optimal one for um, for your case study it's important to remind that uh, models are a simplified representation of reality and cannot predict the future they just can uh, give very useful insight but um, the the deal there is that energy model provide um, and give you the possibility to find trade-off solution and to deal with future uncertainties not certainties so for example uh, with energy modeling you can um, uh, deal with price and and availability of resources, uh, technology development, government commitment, and growth of demand, as mentioned uh, before. But uh, to achieve um, sustainable development goals, we know that uh, we need a uh, um, radical transformation of the energy system uh, but not only of uh, but that cannot go alone so we need a comprehensive energy uh, planning that considers uh, also um, the analysis of energy supply option uh, in light of social and economic perspective um, of the environmental burdens and mitigation of the financial um, constraints and uh, and budget uh, therefore uh, this uh, comprehensive energy planning that includes not only the energy itself but it broads it uh, it, it has a broader uh, view is essential to um, allocate resource in an optimal way uh, to measure the effectiveness uh, effectiveness of a policy for example uh, to comply with environmental uh, constraints and climate objective and to assess the financial viability and the investment requirements as well as um, understanding the social and public acceptance of a technology change so basically what you can do with the energy system modeling or at least the long-term um, energy modeling that we do with the osmosis is to understand uh, in which technology you should invest now so to make a long-term planning which technology to invest now uh, how much that will cost and um, what will look like the energy system in uh, some years uh, ahead Okay, so uh, now uh, before jumping into the uh, the different uh, energy modeling tools, I wanted to give you a quick overview of the process uh, that uh, our energy modeler uh, do when building up the model before getting to the uh, the results. So if you decide then to enroll for the course, use the starter kit, and uh, decide that you want to uh, go further into the energy modeling. Um, uh, word, then you know which are the, the different steps. So first of all, we uh, collect the raw data. This can come from different uh, energy provider, from different uh, sources, database, and partners, uh, as we did for the starter kit. Then the next step is to process this data because most of the time they are they come in different format. They have different units, so we make sure that all the units are consistent to each other. Uh, that uh, the the, the data are in the format needed then by the uh, by the model and then we jump to the formulation of the model so we had we have to add all the data uh, to the model so for example in osmosis we have this uh, spreadsheet based interface that makes it really easy for the user to uh, to add the data all in uh, in one go uh, and it's pretty user friendly because it's an excel uh, interface so most of us know uh, how to to deal uh, with it 
connected. After uh, having all the data inside the, the model, inside the interface, we need to solve this model. So this happens with powerful solver that will that are um, also free and available in most of the time, but sometimes not. Uh, so what does it do, the, the solver? It takes the data that are inside the model and it finds uh, together with the code, the optimal solution, or it finds the solution of the model. Okay, so the next step is the, uh, the, the production of the output. This can be either CSV files or uh, nice graphs that you can interact uh, with. Uh, but it's important to remember that uh, energy modeling is just not number generators. Uh, is also, it, it, we need an extra step that is the final interpretation of the outputs. Uh, so once we have the, this graph, uh, we need an interpretation of what actually they mean in the context in which they are, we are applying it. So it's important then that these are the evidence on which the, uh, a discussion can, uh, can start. Okay, so uh, now let's move uh, on the different, uh, different energy modeling tools. I'll just stop uh, at, uh, at the end and we can take all your questions. So please note down if you have any questions while I'm speaking, then we will open up the floor for, uh, for all, uh, all your questions and um, curiosities. So um, energy modeling tools, we know like there's not only osmosis, there's not only uh, flex tool, and there are not only the uh, CCG um, energy modeling tools, but there is a variety of uh, tools available out there that can be classified uh, with different parameters. The first that I would like to mention is the regional scale. So um, model can focus on little villages, a region, uh, the country, uh, the continent, or also be on the uh, global scale. Uh, then uh, another parameter could be the level of detail, uh, the analytical approach, uh, so bottom up, up top, top down uh, the sector that they are considering. So there are some that consider only um, a specific sector, so like the power sector and other that include also other sectors, society, society such as industry, agriculture, households, and uh, so on. Um, then another parameter is the mathematical program that they use if they are uh, so an optimization the uh, optimization tool or uh, simulation and uh, and so on then last but not least is really important to uh, divide the models depending on the time frame that they cover so we go from short term like uh, the stability analysis that covers seconds to days uh, up to the mid term and long term analysis such uh, as osmosis uh, in this case in the last case we are speaking about decades of of energy planning. So um, um, what is uh, important here is that we can see a picture what, depending on the constraints and the data that we added, will look like our energy system. So uh, we can have a picture uh, farther uh, in, the, um, in, in, in the future uh, to see, OK, if I do this, what happens then? So that's what we uh, would focus on in, in particular, but uh, just to give you a, a quick overview of what, uh, what are the uh, different application of uh, energy modeling tools. So as we said, uh, they can explore the interaction between energy access, resource use and allocation and sustainable development growth. Uh, but also uh, a nice example is the, uh, are the geospatial electrification uh, tools. So these tools help you to, um, to increase the electricity access because they use um, geographical data um, to understand where the grid is right now located and which is the most uh, feasible and most um, the best option, the optimal option for you to bring electricity also to all those people that don't have it um, yet. So that will be or an extension of the grid or uh, the introduction of off-grid uh, solution. Then other models focus on the electricity system flexibility. So to assess the flexibility of the grid. And this, for example, is flex tool. So to 
understand if the system is, uh, if the electricity system, so the grid, is able to cope with an higher share of uh, renewable uh, in. And then, uh, as we said, for example, osmosis, but there's not only osmosis that does long-term capacity expansion planning, uh, we can uh, simulate different uh, scenarios and get insights into the economic and environmental implication of, uh, of them. So basically we'll have uh, three, four optional mini scenario you want to create and then explore which is the best, best pathways uh, in light of the context, context in which you are doing that uh, analysis. Last but not least, we have also this clues model that consider the interaction between energy, um, between uh, energy, climate, land and water. So the, between different system and they don't stop only at the energy, uh, the energy system. Okay, so now let's move on to osmosis itself, and then we will have uh, uh, just a couple of slides on Flex tool. Uh, so osmosis is an open source energy modeling system used to support long term capacity expansion planning. Uh, so uh, osmosis uh, is a, a bottom up um, um, uh, energy model uh, that uh, where you have to add cost, performance, and environmental. Uh, data, so data related to the emission, uh, constraint on the capacity and so on, as you can see here in these different blocks. Uh, so it's a, it has a modular structure, so it's made of different blocks uh, written in plain English, so uh, the, code, the code is completely open source and uh, you are free then if you have a specific case study that you want to analyze uh, to modify the code because it's up there and there is a, a community that is going forward so everyone uh, is able to uh, to modify the code uh, if necessary but otherwise you can use the code as uh, it is uh, as we did for the starter kits so as you can see we have seven core blocks that goes from the objective function to the cost storage capacity um, the energy balance so we add the demands the constraint on the capacity of the reserve margin to then uh, go with uh, the uh, the emission uh, it's completely uh, free and open source also the solver and uh, the uh, the code uh, so some of the application of osmosis osmosis uh, has been used worldwide uh, worldwide uh, in many occasions so first of all we can cite the um, cyprus uh, effort in um, estimating the impact of different energy policies using osmosis so basically what they did is that in one scenario um, they tried um, they insert in added the constraints trains to represent a specific policy on another one, another policy, and then they compare what uh, was the best uh, option for them, uh, as well as in Tanzania, where they explore different electrification pathways for the country. Uh, but uh, apart from national energy outlook, we can also have a continental scale uh, analysis as done for the energy projection for Africa. So in this work, uh, the author considered the entire continent and also uh, each country, but also all the interconnection that were between uh, each of the uh, African countries. Then um, we have the clues modeling that consider the nexus between water, food, energy, and the different ecosystem and the global uh, global scale models uh, such as this one that is uh, designing an 100% renewable uh, global system. So Osmosis uses an interface uh, that Lucy mentioned before that is based on uh, um, Excel spreadsheet so is a uh, is pretty user friendly it because you just need to add the data inside an excel sheet and it supports up to 200 technologies 50 commodities and five types of emission uh, this comes together with the, uh, a broader software so this clicks and software that you see here, here on the right uh, that is free to download and that you can learn uh, how to use the entire software and package in the online course so in the software you you can find the two powerful solver, uh, then the uh, sand interface to add the data in, an access database to store the data, Excel result template to visualize the results, uh, and the uh, script, so the, uh, the code. So basically, you just can just click, download, install in two minutes. You have for free all uh, these uh, bits in uh, installed in your computer. Um, then, uh, so this before would have cost you 
from twenty thousand dollars to hundred thousand, but now it comes uh, open source and uh, for uh, for free. Uh, then uh, just to to close on osmosis, I just wanted to uh, invite you if you decide to um, to work on uh, on osmosis and take the course to join the uh, osmosis Google forum that is uh, an online forum open to everyone uh, that may have uh, any questions. So if you get stuck in the course or in your modeling uh, case study, you can always write a question there. And people are pretty active, so they try to help each other. And you can find also a common issue, uh, so you don't, you can, you you are not stuck, and you can continue with your work. Okay, that was all for osmosis. Let's move very quickly to Flex Tool. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, Flex Tool uh, allow you to uh, understand and assess the flexibility of your system. Uh, and why we should do that? Because we know uh, that renewable, like uh, when we increase the share of renewable in the grid, uh, we have to deal also with the intermittent intermittency of wind and solar um, solar resources. So, uh, as we know, so. Uh, sun does not always uh, shine and wind does not always blow. Uh, so we need always to make sure that demand and supply are aligned and uh, to do so uh, the system should be uh, flexible uh, enough. So with flex tool you can understand if the system is, um, is uh, flexible and if not how to improve the flexibility in a cost effective uh, manner. Uh, what could be this uh, manner? There are different ways. So um, different options such as electric vehicles, hydrogen and hydrogen networks, uh, heat and heat networks uh, uh, to increase the, the flexibility. Um, or for example, electric vehicles that can store electricity uh, inside and then give it back to, uh, to the grid. So if you decide to go uh, for this online course on energy modeling available on uh, the Open University, then uh, you will get uh, a step-by-step -step in instruction and lesson on how to build, first of all, uh, um, energy model, uh, like make some scenario, add the data and make the constraints in osmosis. And then this data, you can use them as an input. So the output from osmosis can be the input for uh, the flex tool uh, assessment. And then uh, with this flex tool uh, uh, developed by Irina, uh, you can learn and assess the flexibility of your uh, energy system. Uh, so that's all uh, from my side. Thanks for, for listening. Um, now we will open up for uh, questions. So please let me stop sharing. Um, please, if you have any question, do not hesitate to, to write it in the chat or in the Q&A or just um, unmute uh, your, uh, your microphone. Lucy, there was anything else that you wanted to, to add? No, I don't think so. Um, if there are any questions yet, yeah, now is the time and there'll also be time at the end of the session. And if there are no questions, we can take a break until uh, 11 UK time when Mark will join for the second half of the session. So I don't see any hands. Yeah. Any curiosity or question something that was not clear don't be scared to ask we are just <laughs> friendly <laughs> there is a question okay Suleiman okay answer mine Okay, Suleiman is asking uh, in the in the Q and A, uh, how do you address the issues around the unstable nature of solar and wind resources in the Flex tool? So uh, basically, what Flex tool does is to uh, give you um, different options. So if then uh, it uh, it realized that your system is not flexible enough, it gives you some options saying, okay, maybe you need to improve your uh, your grid, or maybe you can add uh, these other um, appliances or other solution into your energy system. Um, so, but that happens like when you go through the course, you will see uh, that adding the data, it can assess the flexibility. So it says how much solar is inside this energy system, how much wind is inside the system, and how, bat uh, how many batteries or uh, storage is there. So 
based on this data, then uh, it can assess the, the flexibility. So how the system is ready to respond to address uh, um, sudden change of uh, supply, let's say. Uh, did I answer your, your question? Thank you, okay, great. Any other question or curiosity? If you want, you can also ask it live. We can unmute. Okay, so uh, if then, something pop-ups in your mind, you are free also to ask later when in the next hour. So um, we can take a break until uh, 11 UK time, 12 Italian time. Uh, so we will come back uh, in 12 minutes, let's say. Uh, I see there's another question maybe. Uh, okay, so Bartolome, which model is better suited for use in rural areas that might need geospatial approach? So this is the onset modeling or the geospatial energy planning. So it's one of the course available on the um, open, um, oh, the online course, uh, but Mark will give you a quick um, introduction to, to that. So these are best for, uh, if you want to increase the uh, energy access, the electricity access to uh, rural communities. So onset and uh, gap. Thanks Bartolome for your question. And Ahmad, uh, Lucy, do you want to take this, uh, this question? We didn't exclude geothermal, by, by the way, Ahmad. Thank, thanks for your question, but probably I didn't explain myself um, um, correctly, but we are including all type on, of energy resources. So from geothermal, hydro, wind, solar, uh, and also all the fossil uh, fossil fuel, nuclear, and, and so on. And you are free to add uh, more if you feel that uh, the, um, the energy system or the starter kit is not um, including all of the ones that are um, that are there in your country, so they don't represent well the reality uh, there. So uh, yeah, we are really, close to, to geothermal, we don't want to, to take it off, let's say. I hope this uh, answer your question, Hamad, I mean. Hope so. Lucy, do you want to take the next one? Okay. Um, yes, so can a system without energy storage be said to be flexible with renewables on the grid? Um, I think it, it really, it depends on the, the level of penetration of your renewables and which renewables you're discussing, because uh, solar and solar and wind have different availabilities and they're available at different times of the day. And then I think you often find with renewables that there's, there's a threshold. And if you, if you exceed that threshold of penetration, then you really need to start investing in some kind of flexibility. And that could come from storage, so it could come from grid scale flexibility, but there are other ways to add flexibility without energy storage. So things like demand side flexibility, possibility in the future of using electric vehicles as a source of flexibility with vehicle to grid technology and shifting your demand. So there's the idea of shifting all your industrial demands to when the residential demand is low to kind of spread your demand throughout the day and timing demands for when renewable output is, is highest. But yeah, I think that really depends on the share of renewables in your grid. And, and at the moment, there are kind of a growing number of case studies with a very high share of renewables, but it's still a fairly new field to have very renewables dominant systems. But there are multiple options for flexibility. And I think it should be noted that the batteries aren't the only option. Anything to add, Carla, on flexibility? No, thanks. Okay, so uh, Emmanuel, I hope Lucy, yeah, okay. Reply to your question. Okay, uh, thanks so much for your question. Anyone else? Give you a couple of seconds more, otherwise we'll jump in the, in the break.
Okay, great. So uh, let's come back in about eight minutes and you will have uh, the presentation for the other, uh, the other tools by Mark Howells. Uh, thanks a lot for, for listening and for your attention.
Hi, Mark. Hi. I'm having a short break now. Uh, we've just finished, actually. Um, all the partic participants should have been back for 11. So hopefully we're, we're good to go whenever you're ready. OK, very good. Then, then I'm ready. And I'll share my screen in a second. I do not see the participants in the... OK, very good. I see the participants now. Brilliant. I'll get going. If I could just ask either uh, yourself, Lucy, or Carla, just to let me know if somebody's asking a question, yes. just in case I don't see the stuff on mine. That'd be good. All right. So, good uh, afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on on where you are. Um, my name's uh, Mark Howells. I'm a, an academic at Loughborough University and Imperial College. London and together with Lucy, Carla and a number of others um, we're involved in a project called Climate Compatible Growth where we're developing uh, together with lots of partners and so on tools and material to help improve the, the standard and just the accessibility of energy planning, um, energy planning data, tools, uh, competence, expertise, uh, and so on. And so we're incredibly grateful to be able to partner with the International Energy Agency and, and others, as well as being able to connect with important folk in country. One of the things that we do is we help develop these tools and so on, but um, they're simply tools that are, are there and ready to be to be used and applied. And they have to be used and applied by uh, local experts. And there are two things important for this. The first is, is that it's local experts that understand the context in the country and so on. And so it's impossible for uh, folk elsewhere to be able to, to do that. So that's, that's critically important. And uh, secondly, I think related to that is that um, unless the outputs and so on and the development is owned by the folk, folk in country who are developing the national strategies uh, and so on, then um, there will simply be no buy-in and, and nothing um, and no traction going into the future. So it's, it's two, two things that are, that are very important. Uh, Lucy and Carla have spent a bit of time going through uh, osmosis and flex tool and so on. And that's a really core uh, core tool. It's a core investment tool that helps us think about what to invest in in the future, when, why, how much, how to operate it, and so on. And you need that information to uh, underpin motivation for um, the uh, the assignment of very large quantities of 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 money, and they ha it has very important implications for the way government will be structured and depending on what you in, invest in on how uh, industry is going to be structured uh, as well. So this is, this is critical. And what I'll talk a little bit about are some of the uh, supporting tools that are needed and are available for uh, looking at the, your energy balance situation, um, electrification, how to think about projections for energy demand. So how much do you, how much energy is, is likely to be required if you want a particular level of economic growth. Um, then uh, we'll move on from uh, osmosis, which has been described and so on, into tools that look at financing, as well as how to develop coherent, integrated investment, uh, investment strategies. So that's what we'll go through in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll we'll have a little bit of time for uh, for questions and so on. Another thing that I think is quite important is just to mention that um, that it's the case. I, I want to share my screen very quickly, so let me let me do that while I'm talking. Uh, it's the case that uh, lots of folk from lots of different countries are involved in, in this particular effort. And one thing that is important is that we're, we're kind of working together to create a global community of practice. So 
while it's the case that we had some folk from Nigeria uh, in a summer school that I'll, I'll say a couple of things about in a minute, it is the case that there are um, analysts, both academic analysts as well as government analysts that are working with the same set of tools and data and so on across 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 the world, including a large set of folk in Africa. And there are online communities as well that we'll share information for where you can go online and ask folk for help or insight uh, and so on. And these have been really important and useful because we see a large number of uh, a large number of analysts sharing really important insights from other countries like theirs. So how do you deal with a particular problem that's um, you know, much more regionally specific, let's say, than just something that would pop out of a textbook? Um, the, 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 the tools and other things that we've been talking about today all appear uh, also online in an open university course. So you can get and do an introductory course on all of these things completely for free with free software, with free uh, data uh, and so on. And I, I'm pretty sure that Lucy and Carla must have uh, spoken a little bit about already the, the sort of open data kit, starter data kit for Nigeria. It's far from perfect, but it'll certainly help with getting things up and running relatively uh, quickly. And one of the nice things about uh, this online material is simply that uh, by the time you're done, you know enough about the tools to be able to get started. It's also the case that together with a set of uh, partners, we run uh, summer schools and um, as an international summer school, which just finished, and there'll be the African summer school, which will start um, at the end of at the end of November, just after the COP meeting where it's possible that you can plug in and get a lot of uh, help from international experts and other things that will go through some of the, the material and help coach you through the application of some of these, these tools. And that, again, is done in, in partnership with a number of international organizations. So the International Energy Agency, uh, IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency, UNDP, and a whole bunch of others. And so it's possible to kind of align efforts one last thing about the, um, uh, the online material also is that this is particularly useful, not just um, to get going and so on, but this can be built into knowledge management efforts inside of ministries, uh, universities, and so on. So you can use this as just sort of basic training and say, you know, before getting started, please go through these things. And then when they're out of those, uh, they've got a really good sense of the energy sector from data to investment and, uh, and what's important and sensible to use. Final note is that for university folk on here, we've deliberately made all of this material completely open source. So, you know, if there's anything you like in this, you can just take it and use it in your own, adapt it, adopt it, use it in your own teaching and so on. So to create your own courses from this material is, um, um, is, is easily possible. And where this becomes powerful then is that, you know, it's if you want to do specialized things or take things further, for example, with the IEA's capacity building efforts and so on, you know, you can use this as a very simple basic starting point. And so it's all there, all in one place and uh, relatively well structured. And um, as I say, you can go through, they've got different things for all, all of the courses. You get a certificate when you're done as well, which is, uh, potentially useful. I want to spend one minute to start off with looking at the global electrification platform. That's one of the uh, one of the one of the tools that we have in the in the set. So we've got the global electrification platform. We've gone through this already. Uh, then we'll go through Energy Balance Studio. Then we'll have a look at uh, FinPlan, and then we'll have a look at at Clues, and we'll have a bit of time for questions. So I'm just going to browse through these relatively quickly. And if we have a bit, bit more time, I'll jump into some, some details. So the first thing, the Global Electrification Platform. This is a tool that's been put together, again, with a number of different partners. It provides a really simple starting point to have a look at um, electrification 
options and requirements at the national level, but zooms into every single settlement inside of the country. Uh, the first bit is a, um, an explorer that will, you can click on any one of these countries here, and then you can go through a number of different scenarios. So here's a, uh, an electrification outlook for uh, Nigeria. On the top right-hand side, you see how many people will be grid connected, how many people will be connected uh, by solar, uh, the relative costs, and so on, the, the quantity of investment. And this is for a scenario, uh, depending on how you want to look at potential development in the country. We can have a look at, I think there's about 150 or so scenarios that have pre been pre-cooked uh, that you can have a look at uh, and so on to see differences in uh, you know, how you would electrify towns and villages uh, in the country. And you can, you can zoom in relatively easily to, um, to be able to have a look at those, those settlements and, and so on. So um, this is an explorer, lots of model runs and so on. But behind that is the tool that's been used to create this also free and open source. It's called Onset, that's for, for the open source spatial electrification tool. And you can develop your customized scenarios for how you would like to have a look at things. And those customized scenarios could include things like changing the population to have a look at what happens if there's um, migration or so on, or uh, increasing the amount of electricity that might be used for micro industry or farming or mining and, and so on. And it will calculate it, you know, what the best options are. Should you connect to the electricity grid and expand the grid system? Or should you develop a, uh, a mini grid system? Or should you have standalone systems? And it has results that then get broken down in terms of you know, the technology, the specific location, uh, and the cost requirements. And so in a large number of countries, this tool is being used to kind of guide macro uh, policy, as well as to um, have start conversations very quickly. So it's very possible then to talk to a concessionary finance organization or others with data that can be audited or improved really quickly. And uh, talk about the, the, the level of financing or other things that would be required. Now, here you see a map of uh, the whole of Nigeria. As I say, we can, we can zoom in um, to as much detail as we can go to. And de depending on what data is available, you can model every single person uh, in the country by, by location. You can cut out um, districts or counties or regions and so on, and quite easily do this analysis uh, in as much detail as you want, and so on. And so again, we provide a starter data starter data kit. This is developed with the, uh, the World Bank and a number of other partners. And as with all of these tools, it's the case that if you want to, uh, if you want to dig deeper, there are technical cooperation programs and technical assistance programs where it's feasible to do that. So whether it's the IEA or others, um, they're there. All right, so I want to move on relatively quickly and we'll, we'll browse these, uh, these, these tools and so on. So that's the Open Source Spatial Electrification Toolkit and the Global Electrification Platform. Again, there's the online training that's available through the Open University site, which we shared earlier on. It's all open and free. And um, we'll go back to that if we have a, a bit more time. Another toolkit that, um, that we have as part of this, and uh, this is developed with the um, United Nations Statistical Commission, as well as the, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency. And by the way, I used to work for the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I recall uh, having a couple of very pleasant trips to uh, Abuja to, uh, to teach some of these, these tools and so on with um, Nigerian, Nigerian counterparts. I, I have to admit, fun memories pop to mind of uh, 
of of spicy chili catfish for lunch quite often it was a it was an absolutely delightful um delightful surprise but also very fond memories of uh, starting to do some work in in this space so again energy balance studio is one of the the tools another one of the tools in this uh in this suite if you go into the lecture material you'll find you know various learning outcomes and other things that uh, you can pull out of this. Energy balances are really uh, important. The basic idea behind these and putting them together is number one, they're called a balance because you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. So if you're going to use energy at some point, that has to be transported and it has to be um, converted and then that has to be extracted somewhere. And depending on the efficiencies of all of these processes, you can put together a consistent picture of energy requirements um, uh, in, in the country. And that's what an energy, energy balance is. Here's a, a picture of an energy balance. It's commonly displayed as a, uh, as a table. And at the bottom part of the table, there's a whole bunch of information about where energy is used. And right at the top of the table, where all of the energy comes from. And this is absolutely just critical information without energy as we know uh, economic and much social uh, progress just can't be made and um, it's no surprise that in many countries the uh, energy supply system is very wrapped up with um, uh, national security because they know that this is this is just critical for uh, for development uh, maybe just a, an interesting thing about uh, the table and so on, is it also helps us think about exactly where our energy is being used and where it's important to make sure that we can get secure, reliable supplies and so on. Because having a look at this is really good. You can see where, uh, where consumption takes place. But at the same time, uh, if you were to have a look at which, ones, which of these sectors provides the most important input to the economy in terms of uh, jobs or economic output or so on, we can very quickly see what is most critical for government to be able to supply energy energy for. Uh, this is an energy balance put in, a, in another format. This is uh, a so-called Sankey diagram. And it, again, it just helps us look to understand how energy is being used, how it's being transported and how it's being produced. And again, we, we look at this very carefully because uh, if supplies are interrupted, we have massive economic damage and job losses and social impacts and so on. And the same way, and the other way around, uh, we can use this to think about sort of the future that we want. What do we want in different places to either improve the security of energy supply, improve access to energy supply, or to um, reduce the costs of that energy supply? Um, yeah, so as, as I said uh, before, the system is in balance. You have demand and supply. And if it's out of balance, like we see in the picture on the right-hand side, where there's greater energy demand than is supplied, uh, then we have issues. We, we typically are losing a lot of economic activity. And this is the case in many parts of, um, in many parts of the developing world. And in part, this is often because of two reasons. One is that demand is growing just faster that we, than we can get supplies out there. And um, the other, other reason is that sometimes our systems are poorly designed or they've been poorly maintained and we need to think about how to, how to improve the structures uh, of those. In advanced economies, sometimes it can be because we've not uh, developed the system sensibly enough where we might be supplying large quantities of renewables with intermittency things that have not been carefully planned out, which has happened um, in more than one occasion. And, you know, we'll often see things, for example, in the States um, of late, there have been instances where there have been massive increases in demand for air conditioning because of um, heat waves and so on. And this has created a system that's out of kilter and that can cause various, various problems. So, um, we, we, we need to make sure that we've got this balance and energy balances are useful because uh, 
We've got common units. You can compare our country with another country to see how things are going on. Are we doing well? Are we not doing uh, well? We can develop a whole set of very important indicators. Like, are we very import dependent? And if so, on who? And that can be important for thinking about agreements. How do we do our energy transformation? Are we relatively efficient or inefficient? Are we wasting lots of energy? Could we be better? Uh, the renewable shares and, yeah. Mark, uh, there's a question. Mark, can you refresh your screen, please? It throws on the Nigeria energy map. Ah, okay. Sure. I'm going to stop sharing and then just reshare. Thank you. Please do, please do jump in like that if there is an issue because I see my my screen and not not if it's been frozen or not. So, do you see um, energy balance? The yeah. No. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Colin. Welcome. So energy balances can be used for these. I'll just go back a couple of slides um, uh, in, a, in a second to show you. This is an energy balance table. All countries have got energy balance data in this sort of a, a format, so you can compare between countries. And this is a, a Sankey diagram, and they show the same information. On the left-hand side, you have all of the, or in the, the table, it's at the top, you have all of the energy supplies and on the right hand side, you have energy use and you can map this through the economy. And as you can see in the table, this goes into, into detail that can be mapped to economic activity, um, job levels and so on. So this, this mapping is really important. I was at, at this point, just a few minutes ago, just pointing out that, um, because the system needs to be in balance to work if energy demand is um, outstrips supply, we have, we have various issues. And then we can use these balances to produce uh, lots of critical data that are, are needed simply for managing the, uh, the system as well as thinking about where we want to be into the, into the future. Um, and as you say, you know, energy is critical. It drives all economic and social development. Uh, we need to um, to develop realistic planning, but unless we have quantitative targets, it's impossible to do so. And those quantitative targets are never going to be perfect, but um, they're much better than doing doing nothing. So this is this is the best that we've got. And the nice thing is is that financiers and others understand this. So um, there's large quantities of international financing available for. Uh, energy investments and so on, but that's not available unless there are clear quantitative targets. And these statistics help us to, um, you know, visualize targets, think about how we can adjust and move the system in realistic ways. And uh, the foundation of all good, uh, all good energy planning. So uh, where do energy balances, uh, where do they fit in? They fit in in a number of different places. One is just analysis to understand where we're at. So where is the Nigerian energy system right now? And we can use this for comparison and so on, but to understand what's driving what and, um, uh, and how that can be you know, linked back to sort of economic development, social development and so on. So we, we know what the situation is. The next bit is on the, the planning. None of the things that Carla and Lucy took you through is possible without some level of decent uh, data. And we need to understand the value of different alternatives. Will renewables make the system vulnerable? Will they reduce the cost of the system? Um, what, are, what role does gas have to play, oil, coal, and other things? So we can look at the, the value of these different alternatives. Uh, nuclear is another one, then, and a whole, whole set of them. The tool, but the point is, is that we need the data to be able to make that evaluation. Then we go on to planning uh, policies and so on to support the sort of futures that we, the, the, the alternatives that we might have uh, valued and decided we, we think are important. And then the sort of planning, the management of all of these, these things. You know, one thing that's really important is on the one hand, you need this quantitative information in order to release financing and mobilize finance flows. But it is also the case that depending on the system, the, the way 
said you were going to structure the system uh, and how big different parts of it are going to be. You're going to require um, adjustments in your institutional setup in order to be able to manage that future. Many countries have, including the UK, have an institutional setup that was appropriate for the past, but things are changing quite quickly. And the only way we can think about how to make sure our institutions are appropriate is by thinking about what that energy system is going to look like. So we know how to manage that, uh, manage that sensibly. And again, this is um, this is something that's that's nationally nationally specific. If you want to have an energy system that, for example, takes advantage of super cheap uh, solar because its costs have been reduced uh, massively over the last uh, five years and are likely to continue to be reduced into the into the future, that comes with management management challenges and with quantitative data we could think about how to structure the system to 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 cope with with that and so you need that um and then finally for for monitoring and so on you put in place policies and so on are they achieving what it is that they want what we want to achieve and we can have a look at things like compliance and all sorts of other things that are important so these energy balances are just a sort of critical uh step and they're used by governments industries academics ngos international organizations and so on and i just bring up the latter because you know often for um trade agreements other protocols and so on at some point you will use information from these energy balances so if you're the the, the climate change meeting coming up at the end of the year it's the case that you will be calculating co2 emissions from an energy uh, balance. If you do projections into the future, those will come from future projected balances and so on. And so typically, we have this sort of a, a process where we'll collect data, process it, analyze it, and we'll do that first bit in a, in a tool called Energy Balance Studio. And then um, there's very various planning policies and monitoring that can take place. Now, uh, Energy Balance Studio is a um, I want to move on to that right, uh, right away. Whoa, let's move on, here we go. Um, Energy Balance Studio is a tool that is was developed, as I said, by uh, UN Statistics and the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's a relatively simple tool. There are more complicated, more detailed methods and approaches out there. The International Energy Agency provides absolutely the best sort of next level up uh, from this for folk to get into and use. However, this is really good to be able to get a really basic understanding and so on. So if you want to increase the general literacy of energy balances to be able to underpin, get the foundations right for uh, planning, this is, um, this is one, of the, one of the tools that are, that are there. There's information, uh, in the the toolkit that you can go into, and various things that uh, that you can uh, that you can work through uh, work through there. So, key points from this particular presentation, and I've just skimmed through it. It's available all online with much more detail with uh, and so on for you to go through. Is that energy planning as well as other government planning needs sound energy statistics. Uh, the energy balance plays a really important role in the in this particular process. There are various best practices that are available. Energy Balance Studio, which is developed by a number of others, um, show how this can be applied. And we've got all of the, the things in there uh, that, that folk could use. And it's the case that once you're on top of this, uh, there are more complicated, uh, better methods that are available, uh, for example, uh, from the International Energy Agency. So I'll stop off with that one there and we'll move uh, move on. I'd like to ask, are there any questions for the moment? Otherwise, I'll, I'll just move on to the next presentation, which will be around um, uh, energy demand projections. All right, so I'll move on to the next presentation. So hopefully you can uh, you can see my screen uh, right now, and this one is on 
an introduction to the model for energy analysis and demand uh, projections. And then we'll talk about uh, projections for electricity demand. Now, from the energy, um, from our energy balances, we have a really good picture of how energy is produced, how it gets transformed and so on, and how it's, how it's used. And that's a snapshot of the economy. It's what's happening in a particular year, whether it's a historical year, current or future. Now, a key thing though, that we need to be able to do is to think about how future demand is going to evolve over time. The structure of the economy now is going to be you know, it's different from what it's going to be uh, into the into the future. And, and you may have various plans and ideas for how you want the Nigerian economy to look in the future. However, unless the appropriate energy supplies are available, that future picture of the Nigerian economy is simply not going to be uh, not going to be met. So this uh, model for the analysis of energy demand helps to think about long-term uh, analysis. So in long-term, what is the economy going to look like? And it uses fairly detailed bottom-up information to understand how this demand for energy uh, may change with a particular look at how things might evolve um, in terms of structure of the, the economy, as well as, as well as a number of of other things. And there are two sides to this. So I mentioned that without the right energy supplies going into the economy, you're not going to have the economy that you want. So it's really critical to understand how much energy is going to be demanded to make sure that that can be supplied. But there's a very positive view on this as well. And that is that if you understand how the economy is going to develop, and we know how much energy can be, will be demanded and can be paid for. This allows us to think about uh, what the optimal supply mix will be and to understand um, how that should be shaped and structured so that you can come up with the lowest cost way of supplying that energy to the, to the rest of the economy, which was covered a little bit in the, um, in the, osmosis, in the osmosis lectures. Now, the model for the analysis of energy demand is really quite simple. There's a very simple equation that just gets broken down into a lot of detail that says your future demand is going to be a function of a, um, some sort of intensity to how much energy do you need to get something out. So if you've got office buildings, it's how much energy do you need to um, make sure that there's adequate electrical supplies, lighting, cooling, and so on per square meter. Uh, so there's a, an energy intensity multiplied by, an, an, by some sort of driving variable. And that might be how you see this, the contribution to GDP growing over time, or maybe the uh, square meterage of uh, floor space increasing over time. And this is the case for almost anything uh, throughout the economy. So for mining, it could be the tons, how many tons of a particular ore do we expect to be able to get out of the ground? We know roughly how much electricity is required per ton of ore or how much other energy sources required per ton of ore. And then we can start to build up pictures, how much office space, how much mining, how much transport, how much of any kind of important economic activity is, is required and for that to be supported, how much energy is, is in turn required uh, for that. Another thing that's particularly important is that we have these simple equations that help us think about how much energy is required. But as I say that, and this, this can help account for two different things. As I said earlier, earlier on, one of those things is that the structure of the economy is likely to, uh, to change over time. So, if we have a look at this simple table over here, we've got uh, two little elements of an economy, a uh, steel industry and a textile industry. They have different amounts of energy required per dollar of output, but it may well be that um, this, the, the, the relative production or the absolute production from these industries change over, uh, over time. And you might see, for example, here, if the steel industry 
halves in terms of its um, its total output, but the textile industry, you know, grows much faster and creates much more economic activity. Uh, it's the case, interestingly, that although you have more economic activity, you may end up with less energy than you started out with. Okay, this is just for one particular instance demonstrating that if you change the the um, the economic structure of the country, your energy demand changes as well, and you need to plan for that. In most cases, however, and certainly in the Nigerian case, we expect that energy demand overall is going to uh, is going to increase importantly and quickly over over time. And we go through all of the different sectors in the economy to be able to uh, to do this sort of analysis. So we think about agriculture, construction, mining transport and and so on everything that you saw in that um in in that energy balance earlier on and sometimes we have great data around how energy is used so for example are you pumping for uh for irrigation are you using steam inside of industry are you heating things are the specific ways we're using energy and so on and we can uh we we, we can split all of that up and that can be valuable but sometimes we don't have terrific information about you know, the, the absolute detail of what's happening in different places. And so we can use aggregate information. So uh, aggregate information from economic projections for, for different sectors. And this again can be useful. So we can get going without a huge amount of, uh, of, of detail. We can then like, you know, dive into very specific pieces of information if we have have that. So, for example, if we know with freight transport approximately how many um, ton kilometers of goods are transported, we can figure out how much energy we need for freight. And similarly for passenger, passenger kilometers transported, we can we can estimate how much information is required for for passengers. And we can go into lots more detail depending on how much data we have available. So, at a very basic level, we can use this just to absolutely sanity check what we think the future is going to look like. Uh, but we can go into a huge amount of, of detail as well. And for different sectors, we have different things that we typically look at. So we spoke about value added passenger kilometers uh, for the household sector, maybe number of dwellings for uh, buildings and uh, commercial. This could be floor area, as I was saying earlier on, or value added by sector. And this is all used for different things. I mentioned space heating, cooling, water heating, electric appliances, and so on. And so with all of this information, we can start to uh, pick out a sensible level of understanding of what demands are going to, going to look like, how they're going to change uh, over time. And I want to come to this, this picture here. And we use this tool to then uh, create this little matrix where we can understand, you know, overall what might be happening to different sectors and we do that by looking at the subsectors and then within those subsectors how energy is used and then depending on how energy is used what fuel sources used for those and we can aggregate all of those up and really quickly the, the simple output is is that for different uh projections of economic and social economic activity and population into the future we can get fairly robust estimates of what that will mean for how much oil is needed, how much um, electricity is needed, and uh, other energy demands or service demands are, are needed. And so typically to do this, we'll have a, we'll, we'll look at a base year, we'll construct some scenarios, and then we'll develop some, some projections. And just important to be able to iterate this so that we've got a very clear picture of if we want this future in Nigeria, um, these are the inputs and so on that would be required. And then we can go back and sense check these and, and iterate them and so on. And we can look at various uh, scenarios into the future as well. I mean, what happens if growth is faster than we expect or slower than we expect and so on. And this gives really valuable information that's uh, required for, for various, various different things. In terms of defining, you know, what's going to make things grow faster or slower uh, and so on. There are a number of sort of driving, so not the driving parameters that we typically put into into the models. So it would be around 
GDP or the relative contributions of different industry, like we, we had with the textile example, um, population growth, size of families, are we having one dwelling with a lot of people living in it, or is there a move so that there's uh, more dwelling space per person and so on? What's happening with car ownership? Is that ramping up or not? How are technologies changing and, and so on? And then from that, we get our, um, our projections. And it's typically useful to think about developing something that can be used in planning. I would recommend just a, a sort of low, intermediate, and high scenario as a, uh, as a start. Okay, so again, all of this is available online. The tool is free to, to download, and um, uh, you, can, you can get access to that. So just want to stop there and see if there are any more. Yeah, Mark, there questions. is a question from Ola Lekan. How can we overcome management challenge in ensuring effective energy balance for Nigeria? Yeah, so this, this is a great uh, question and there's no way that we can answer all of this in the, in the time that we have available right now. But a, an important observation is this, is that, and, and there are two things, is that without the data and so on set up so we can transparently see what we're gaining or what we're losing, it's very difficult to make a case one way or the other. So we think it's very important to be able to pull this data together in order to be able to have a conversation, a debate around um, what is good for the country or what is not good for the country. And without quantitative information, it's difficult to, uh, to, to do that. So first off, we would suggest that these sorts of analytics are really, really important. Even if you don't have access to perfect data, you have enough access to data to get started, to be able to start that conversation, which then um, impacts, impacts management and so on. The next point, which I think is really important, is that you know, there are several countries, and we'll, we'll be developing some case studies for, for one and two, just to make one or two, just to make this completely clear, is that when we have this data that's clear from energy balances through to scenarios through to investment outlooks. There are large quantities of money available for investment. And the better versed we are with data and tools and so on, you know, the easier it is to make a case to say that actually, if we could do this, then we can get this level of investment. If we don't, we won't get that investment, but at least the smoke and mirrors are gone. It's completely clear where it is that changes need to be made or what improvement in um, data quality or analytics needs to be made to get that investment. And I think that's the first step here, yeah, is to make sure that uh, we, can, we, can, we can paint a very clear, quantified picture that's, that's uh, beyond reproach, because with that, we can, we can start the conversation that we need. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next presentation very quickly. This will be very fast, uh, by the way. I just want to um, I just want to point out that uh, on the one hand, we've got, okay, so there's another question. How can you advise Nigerian government to go about collecting energy statistics and environmental uh, statistics? So again, this just goes back to this. If we're on top of this process, we understand the value of the, the data. Okay. And then it's possible to go to government and say, with this data, we can potentially get this level of investment or whatever the, the outcome is that's, that's important. Okay. And I think that's a very, very powerful argument. I've had the privilege of working in a lot of countries where you'll go to the Statistics Commission and they're just collecting data. You know, they've gotten something that they worked with with UN statistics or otherwise, and they're collecting collecting information. And it may well be that that's not necessarily the information you need, or it's not of the quality that's needed and so on. But with this, with these tools, you can go back and say, well, with better data, uh, either in terms of quality or specific things that are being collected, uh, we are going to be able to motivate for a lot more investment. And this is really important. You know, sometimes I find it weird that we um, I'm, I'm from South Africa, by the way, so I'm a, I'm a dual national, I'm South African and British, but in South Africa, often be a bit strange because, you know, we find that 
if one takes a step back and have, has a look at the potential investment, it's a much, much bigger playing field. And there's a battle going on to be able to say, look, this is, this is the potential that's there. And being able to do that is important. The next bit is that, that this is not as difficult as it may sound to get started with. Um, so, to answer, so for example, uh, UN Statistics and Nigeria and the IEA already collaborate in developing energy balances and, and data and so on. So there's already some things there. So there's enough to get started with. So this is not uh, as daunting a challenge as, as it may seem. Also, a lot of the demand projections that are there as well, uh, you can you can get from the National Planning Commission and uh, other kind of economic uh, focused activities in government too. And I again, I would suggest that the strength in this is that you can show what the implications are, which is very motivating. I mean, nobody wants to collect data for the sake of collecting data, but if you can show that that data is going has the potential to bring in, you know, 10, 100, million, 100 billion dollars worth of investment to the country, well, that changes the conversation. We hope to have some of these um, case studies available as well for, for other countries which people can at least use as anecdotal information. So MIDE EL uh, is the same as MIDE D for demand. This one just focuses on electricity. And this is important as well because electricity systems are a bit different. You know, in the middle of the, the, the night on a, on a summer evening, it may be that we don't use a lot of electricity, but in, in the, the, the middle of a working day, any other time of the year, we might use lots of electricity. And so we have a fluctuating demand and we have to, we have to size our power system to be able to meet that. With stuff like oil, it's not such a big deal because you can store it cheaply, but electricity, you can't. So it's very important to make sure supply and demand match all of the time. So MyDL is a tool that you can, um, uh, you, can, you can download and use just like MyD. And what it does is it helps you to put this picture together that you see on the screen right now. And this is a picture of changing electricity demand. And you need, for the electrical engineers, you need to make sure that they have structured the system so that you supply electricity when you need it to meet uh, this sort of demand. So this is an extra uh, little tool that's quite special. And um, it's the case that it projects future, future demand. Again, like MyD, it looks at the, the different demand profiles of different sectors. So we use electricity differently in agriculture, for example, to steel making or to households. And um, in the same way, we, we have a look at how uh, these, these different sectors are going to grow overall. So we get the annual stuff that will go into the energy balance. But then we also have a look at how things vary with seasons, how things vary during the week. Sometimes we work during weekdays and things taper off during the weekend um, in industry. And that might be the inverted pattern for households. And then we have a look at the, how these uh, vary by day. And then the result is, is that we can get these sort of detailed pictures of what electricity demand will look like and then you size the electricity system uh, to, to, to meet this. And important, so this particular graph just comes from something that was done in the background, just that, you know, again, depending on what industries and other things are growing, these pictures change. And getting a good idea of these pictures is important because you get to know exactly how much electricity uh, will be bought or sold. And that's a money value, which is then translated into investments. The equations are all actually pretty simple. They just put up here for, um, for transparency. But the thing is, is that they're all simple. They're all about you know, how much electricity is used at a particular time of the day. And then you, you multiply that out with differences by um, day type, by, by week, by season, and so on. And then you get this, uh, this demand information, which is important for, uh, for planning. I'm going to shoot through the next presentation really quickly because we're running out of time and I would like to have a, a little bit of time to, um, uh, to be able to discuss some of these things. So FinPlan, uh, very quickly. This is a tool that helps you think about, so now this comes, we've done energy balance, we've done the projections. 
we've used uh, osmosis and flex tool to make sure we've structured the energy system and the power system to meet all of these things sensibly. And you've got a good economic case. We can now say that this power plant is going to provide us with cheaper electricity for this economic activity. We know the economic activity can pay for it. So we've got something quite powerful here. We can go out and look for investment. And uh, FinPlan is a tool that simply helps us think about how to make that, uh, make that investment case. Okay, so we can think about this industry and we can think about how to make sure policies are set up in a way to reduce the financing cost. That there's financial arrangements that reduce the risk for investors. Uh, we can make sure that the financial system is properly structured and um, it plugs into different kinds of financing availability. And um, the tool itself will help think about how to structure an enabling environment, why these are important, uh, develop financial indicators. And by the way, energy ministries are typically really bad at being able to talk in finance terms to the finance ministry and so on. And similarly, the finance ministry is often typically really bad at understanding the technology implications in the energy sector. So this tool, uh, bridge, bridges that, uh, uh, that gap. And one thing that's important is it will help you think uh, particularly about how to blend finance. There's a lot of development funding available. We also think about private capital and how to pull these together to get the, uh, the best deal and make it you know, attractive for, for investors into the future. And there are various things to, to consider. And one thing that's important is we're seeing more and more blended finance around the world as mega investments are, are, uh, are taking place. And we have various information on what stops some of that, um, that blended finance and what's needed to make sure that it comes in. And again, you're looking at investments of you know, tens of billions of dollars. So these are very, very big investments. They're big enough that once you've got a case, you can go to the finance ministry or the planning commission or otherwise to say, you know, there's, if we were to change our rules or uh, evolve our rules a little bit, we are more likely to get this kind of investment based on the data. Again, that's a very uh, powerful, powerful argument. And you can get all of this information from the FinPlan uh, tool and go through uh, the, the basics of this as well. And as I say, really good for the finance ministry to understand aspects of the energy energy sector and similarly for the energy sector to the energy ministry to be able to to talk uh the language of the finance ministry that can be that can be important uh the last the last one we won't spend too much time uh going through but i would like to just pull up one picture and then we should have a minute or two for some uh some questions and answers and as i say everything is available online so if anything here is interesting either via um, uh, either via um, Ono and the IEA is the case that we can you can get more information through. I want to get clues up and running. We can either get more information uh, through this activity, or you're welcome to go online and. Um, get it for yourselves. We've gone to some lengths to make sure that it's available. Uh, just to ask, can you see the presentation that says climate, land, and energy and water strategies? Right Not now. yet. Oh. Okay, let me just try and reshare that. I see that, I think I saw what the problem was a little bit earlier on. Okay, is that available now? Yes. Okay, terrific. So we've spoken a lot about energy and financing the energy sector and so on. Important to understand though, and from the finance ministry's point of view or the economics ministry, this is often critical, is that infrastructure is related. What you do on land, what you do in energy and what you do with your water affect each other. And often the finance ministry or economics ministry has a difficult thing to do to pick between different infrastructure policies. And this particular tool just helps you make sure that you've got the, um, you have these different infrastructure policies 
aligned. And this is to meet very important goals, how to get you know, proper food to folk, proper uh, electricity and healthy energy, how to make sure we have uh, you know, proper water um, supply and so on. So land, energy, water, you know, really speak to our basic resources and how do we map all, how do we use these sensibly and how do we get sensible information in order to be able to uh, think about our macro policies. And there are, this tool, we think about the links between all of these systems and um, come up with, you know, just very, very, very clear information for integrated policy making. There are many examples of failure. One is Punjab in industry, in India, for example, where uh, what happens is, is that the government uses Punjab to produce a large amount of rice for you know really poor people in the country. And to do that, it provides farmers with free electricity so they can pump water to do the irrigation. But as they pump water to do the irrigation, the water table drops, they don't use it uh, rationally and so on. And whenever the water table drops, they need more electricity. So the electricity demand is increasing rapidly, but the country's short of electricity. The water level is going down a lot, which is gonna make this region vulnerable into the, the future for it for it being able to produce crops and so on. But a large proportion of the country actually will rely on that. So there's this, there's this kind of compounding problem that is going to give the, the entire country a real shock uh, into the future. And this is simply because the water, energy, and land use policies are not sensibly aligned. It's also the case that what happens is it's, it's often easier just to you know, put in place more um, fossil fuel power plants to meet this growing demand. And the demand need not grow this fast. Uh, and as a result, you get more and more greenhouse gas emissions as well. And it's really silly because if you were to unpack this and do it differently and use a tool like this to think about it, you could attract carbon financing for different types of energy infrastructure, do better things with the efficiency of the farming and so on, and create an integrated picture, which is very useful for the management uh, of the country. We won't go through this too much, but just to say that it's the case that these systems are deeply interlinked. If we make investments in the agriculture sector without thinking about energy or investments in the energy se sector without thinking about water or investments in water without thinking about agriculture and so on, uh, we can end up with really problematic systems. And we see this all over the world. And so this tool was created simply to help think about, well, how can we make sure that we we don't have these particular problems and how can we make sure that for every dollar of money spent we get the best uh infrastructure benefit that's that's possible and in the background of the tool there's a uh a bit like you saw with energy that goes from energy to other sectors and you can have a look at all kinds of things that are useful for government to be able to do integrated uh planning into the future across these different sectors all right so with that i will end off so thank you very much for the time and trouble we are on the dot at on on the hour but if there are some questions or otherwise please do uh please do feel free to ask one or two now otherwise we'd be very happy to um uh to follow up into the into the future i see that carla's uh kindly provided some links where you can get information to the uh to our newsletter and so on we have these summer schools that are run everybody's free to everybody's welcome to apply the, the the schools are free the entrance requirements are quite are quite stringent so it is a it is a difficult application uh, process but we've had the privilege of having several nigerians take part on on in those already and there's there are two of those every uh, every year and um yeah please please do feel free via honor to be in in contact uh, and so on we're really very happy to be able to support the iea uh in this particular effort are there any other i see a question that's just popped up ah okay so um there was a question about no mention was made uh about message as a tool uh for energy supply message is an excellent tool and um, uh, osmosis is pretty much an open source implementation of message. So whatever you learn for 
osmosis you can take over to use in message and vice versa. Uh, we simply didn't mention message because there are lots of tools that we didn't mention and uh, they are good tools. So there's Leap, which is a great tool. Message is a good tool. Markel Times are, are good tools. Uh, the difference with osmosis, which is the one that we start off with, is simply that it's completely open source and completely uh, free. So um, folk have, have access to that. Interestingly, um, the information that we put up and online wouldn't be lost. If you learned this stuff, you'd be able to transfer it to message uh, really easily. Just for information, I, um, I teach people how to use message and have used message uh, a lot. I also help write osmosis based on um, based on on some of the stuff with message and the message developers as well. So there's no um, yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't be losing anything by looking at these other tools. And certainly all of the data sets and other things could be used in uh, osmosis, but they could also be used in message, Markel, Times, Leap, and all of these others uh, others as well. So uh, it's a great tool, you know, and, and there's support from the IAEA to use that. And the IAEA uh, have been involved in the development of osmosis as well as a really nice uh, complement to, to message. And it's very likely that in the next, in future iterations of message development that we'll see the two tools just converging more and more, but they're fundamentally the same. Are there any other other questions that folk have at the minute? Uh, Afolabi, uh, I'll give you permission to speak. Now you should be able to speak. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Mark and uh, Kala and the team for this insightful section today. I just wanted you to shed more light on um, assessing the whole free material. Um, that's one. And also shed more light on the on the summer school and the uh, the school coming up in November. Uh, I also want to say that um, why you, you mentioned there that the application is a little bit stringent, but I, I, I'll say, is it not online? If it's online, why do you need to make the application stringent so that to allow um, a lot of people have access and, and also to, to share knowledge. I think it's, it's very useful if you please consider to make the application less stringent and, and, and allow more people to come in because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in joining the, well, if it's stringent, which means it will be more competitive and a lot of people will have space to come in. Um, so please. Thank you, but um, great job, great, great discussions, and um, and 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 I've learned a lot. Thank you, Afalabi. Thank you very, very much for the uh, the question. So there are there are two things that uh, I want to up just about the uh, the stringent uh, or the competitive applications. The first is is very, very much a uh, well. There are three things I want to bring up actually. So the first is is that. You know, all of the material online is free and there are discussion fora that are very active that you could go on to now and get support and advice, you know, over time. So there's at one level, everybody is absolutely uh, welcome. And th those resources that we can make available for community and so on are there. And so um, if you go online to the courses and go into those links, um, that's, that's there. For the uh, the summer school and what we the uh, and the energy modeling platform meeting, so these are the summer school meetings. We've ha we've had to make the um, the process competitive simply because we want to make sure that um, with uh, with the experts and so on that we have that we can give really good one on one sort of hands-on advice and engage with the people that are there. We find that if, if it becomes too big, then we really can't provide sensible one-on-one -on -one, um, input and discussions and tutoring and so on, which is really important. So um, we, we, we simply have a resource constraint and have a, 
uh, we typically find that I think, you know, for each trainer, we can cope with about um, 10 to 15 uh, people. But if there are more people, we, we simply can't provide the input that's helpful. And uh, we want to make sure that this is an absolutely world-class um, experience. Now, the, the other side to that is that we are approaching uh, organizations for more resource to be able to get more trainers involved so that that constraint goes away. And so it's the case that for the, the meeting in Africa at the end of the year, even though it's a virtual meeting and all of the meetings, because we can have more people be virtual as well as in person into the future, uh, we are speaking to organizations to try and get a hold of more resource as a function of who applies. So everybody will be free to apply the, you know, the, they have to be relatively stringent. I mean, if, if we can show to funders that somebody is coming along to this and they're going to be using this work either to help build capacity in the country, maybe via universities or other things, or they're going to be using this because it's directly relevant to the policy analysis and so on. And if we can get some sort of indication back to funders that that's uh, that's important, then it's easier to get them to release resource. And as soon as we can do that, then we can increase uh, numbers to uh, to the courses, as I say, it, or to the, um, to the schools, because sim we simply want to make sure that everybody who comes along gets, gets really good uh, assistance and, uh, and good tutoring. The, uh, the, the African uh, focus course and the global course they happen the, the global course happens in around about july every every year so we just finished uh, one off now the african course is being based based well, it's virtual in mauritius at the end of november applications uh the call for applications with all of the criteria which will be quite clear will um be made uh, likely within the next month or so and um, everybody's free to to apply as i say because we have the, the constraint that's there the stronger your application is uh the better we will be going out and looking for more fun and and so on it's also the case that um if you wanted to and this is important uh because we're doing this with the iea and this is part of an iea program it may be possible to get uh, more funds through there as well, but um, but just to say, so that the, the oh yeah, and the courses they're typically two weeks, two weeks long. One where we make sure that you've got you pick one of the tracks. We make sure that you can do the the basic things and you've got all of the basic knowledge set up and that's solid. And then we spend a week doing an application, a kind of policy application uh, to uh, the country in question. So that could be an electric electrification piece for Nigeria or something looking at developing energy balance or a finance case or future scenarios and so on, depending on which track you're involved in. Uh, so you know, at, at one level, all of this material is available and you can get access to, to folk if you go onto the discussion for it and, and so on. At another level, we have these, these summer schools that are limited because of supply constraints to make sure that they're good and you can get the best input that you can but we are looking to in, increase the the funding for those so, simply so we can get more uh more trainers uh, involved and then we can make sure that then we can if we have more participants they just get the uh the best the best support that they can that they can get other other and thank you by the way for the uh uh for the for the kind words. We're also looking for, you know, creative solutions to this too. We do want to make sure that, you know, this is so critical for development, right? And in the past, most of this material has either been, um, you know, stuck with consultants who charge a fortune or um, in programs that have struggled to make them openly available, again, because of resources. And so, you know, good creative ideas for how to get this out there better and be more supportive. We're, we're very, very keen to, uh, to, to listen to. And I'm sure it's the case that Arno and others at the IEA have got uh, good ideas as well.
are there any other questions uh, for the moment? Okay, so I think I think we've uh, very happily gone a little bit over time, and uh, we're extremely happy, as I say, to be working under the uh, IEA in this effort. Uh, there are connections with all kinds of other partners and so on with these uh, with these tools, and um, are very happy to see how we could try and explore uh, supporting uh, things as a function of of uh, of your demand and so on. We all come from this program that we're involved in the Climate Compatible Growth Program. We're a set of universities that include um, Loughborough University, Imperial College, University College London, uh, KTH in Sweden, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on. So we're, we are, you know, we have some top universities. And another thing we would be very keen on doing is um, uh, partnering with universities too, so that you know we can increase the um, increase the capacity uh, and and so on. Because we also think it may be important that as uh, Nigeria uh, develops and comes up with new solutions and other things, it'd be really nice to be able to partner with hubs, and then some of the lessons can be can be taken to other places as well. All right. So with that, I'd like to I'd like to end off. Thank you very very much for the time and trouble. Thank you to uh, Carla and Lucy. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything from the IEA or Carla or Lucy that uh, we should add at this at this point. Uh, no, Mark. We can close the session, and there should be someone from IEA that stops the recording if I understood correctly. Okay. Great. Then we'll close the session for now. But you know, as a first point of call, please do direct questions and requests and so on through to the IEA. And as a as a second point of call, you're absolutely more than welcome to go online and get access to all of the material and other things. And please do make those applications to the um, the African Energy Modeling Platform meeting uh, at the end of the at the end of the year. There, as I say, it's um, our constraint is simply on resources for training, but the more applications we have uh, that are good, and please do um, make sure that they're, 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 they're well motivated. The more applications uh, we have, the easier it will be to, to argue for increased, increased resource. But thank you so much for your time uh, and trouble. It's a real privilege to be able to connect and hopefully at some point uh, connect in person rather than, than just online. Thank you.